Good morning. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. I am really delighted. I'm Ann Leonard, a Manton Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Clark. I'm really delighted to welcome you uh, to the opening lecture for Printed Renaissance. Um, this is our latest show and the last show that we'll, we'll be opening this summer. So with uh, Printed Renaissance, the full array of the Clark's summer offerings is now open. And I really urge you to check out as well while you're here today, uh, oh, there's well, um, to check out, <coughs> excuse me, Edward Monk, uh, Trembling Earth, and Humane Ecology, Eight Positions up the hill at the Lunder Center. Um, you have a lot of treats in store for you and I hope you'll come back often over the summer. Giving today's lecture is our guest curator for Printed Renaissance, Yue Feng Wu, a 2022 graduate of the Williams Graduate Program in History of Art. And after receiving his MA last June, uh, Yue Feng went on to the PhD program in art history at the Johns Hopkins University. And I am so glad he was willing to make the drive up from Baltimore to give this lecture in person. It's wonderful to have you back. Um, thank you and congratulations on this fascinating exhibition you have curated um, which, with such intelligence and thoughtfulness. So most of the preparations for Printed Renaissance were actually completed last summer when uh, before leaving for Johns Hopkins, Yue Feng had a full-time internship in the Manton Study Center for Works on Paper. This was supported by the IFPDA, International Fine Prints uh, Dealers Association Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and in fact, uh, Yue Feng was an intern in my department for the entire two years of his MA program. And just on a personal note, I, I well remember interviewing him for that position um, he was freshly arrived from the University of Pennsylvania, where he earned a degree in art history and business economics. And this was fall 2020, so we were still in lockdown and the interview was over Zoom. But I so well remember Yue Feng's excitement and enthusiasm just coming through the computer screen. And I thought to myself, here is someone who will really take full advantage of what this opportunity has to offer. And I think that this exhibition, Printed Renaissance, is indeed proof that he did. Uh, during his time here, he explored not only the prints and works on paper <clears throat> in the museum collection, but also the library's collection of books, as you will see uh, in the exhibition. Uh, I'm happy to say, I, I don't think I'm uh, presuming too much to say that the germ of this project was a print that um, he studied in a course I taught um, and it was the subject of his final paper, a, a print, a Renaissance print with a very interesting publication history that he uh, sort of sorted out through his sharp eyes and good, and good research. So I won't steal his thunder, I'll let him tell you all about it, but just let me say the pride I feel in seeing your development over these, uh, these years and, and what you're going on to do now in your PhD program. Uh, in addition to Yue Feng himself, I would really like to thank the, uh, the crew, my many colleagues at the, Smart, uh, the Clark who worked on this exhibition um, over the past year. Yue Feng was involved in a, quite a number of meetings uh, on, online and uh, responded to quite a number of requests. It was a team effort. I wanna thank everyone for their efforts. And in particular, also I'd like to express gratitude for the generous support of the Malcolm Hewitt Wiener Foundation uh, for financial support of the exhibition. Um, you're really in for a treat today um, and please welcome Yue Feng to the podium. Okay, um, thank you so much, Anne, for the uh, generous introduction. Uh, and to everyone uh, at the Clark who helped uh, making this exhibition happen. Um, I'm really, uh, it's such a pleasure to be back. I have very fond memories of Williamstown, um, even during two years um, of lockdown uh, during the pandemic. Um, yeah, so uh, I just feel like I have to be here uh, in person now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm truly grateful to have this uh, very precious opportunity um, to intern uh, in our print room, the uh, Menton Study Center for Works on Paper, uh, and to eventually experience this whole curatorial process, and especially at such an early stage of my um, career. Uh, the idea of the project, uh, as Anne mentioned, uh, originated from the class that she taught in the fall of 2021, I believe. 
uh, where she led a group of students in tracing out the history of European printmaking uh, through the close study of works in the Clark Collection. Uh, and it was in this class that I encountered and subsequently investigated um, the curious story of one reproductive engraving from the Italian Renaissance. Reproductive means uh, that it is a copy of a drawing or a painting um, of another usually more renowned artist. Uh, this, and this is the Massacre of the Innocents, designed by the Florentine sculptor Baccio Bandinelli, representing the biblical story of King Herod, depicted in the center, um, right there, <clears throat> uh, who ordered the murder of young children in the vicinity of Bethlehem in an attempt to kill the newborn Christ. The print was impressive at once for the large size of the sheet and the dramatic action depicted through a host of almost grotesque bodies. But what fascinated me most was that in addition to the inscription of the artist and his printmaker, there are two more signatures printed at the bottom of the sheet, added, as it turns out, by later publishers of the print. These clues allowed me to establish some important information about this particular printed uh, impression we have at the Clark, namely that it was a 1540s copy after an original version of Bandinelli's drawing engraved originally in the 1520s then two, two, days, two decades later, this copy was made and first sold in Rome through the print shop of Antoine Lafrerie, um, whose, signature, whose signature we see right here. Uh, if he was a Frenchman working in Rome who added his signature here. But then one full century later, the print was reissued into the market sometime between 1650 and 1690 at the shop of a printer by the name of Giovanni Giacomo de Rossi, who advertised advertise his business here uh, by including his name and the location of his shop. It was a family-run print shop near the church of Santa Maria della Pace in Rome, hence uh, the Formi Roma, uh, Roma alla Pace. Now, why do we get these copies after copies and new editions of old prints? Let's look closely at a few of them. This is the original 1520s version of the massacre at the Princeton Art Museum. It looks almost exactly the same as our copy, but is in fact twice as large. We see none of the publisher's information, but only the piece of paper bearing the name Bacchios Florentinus and an SR monogram, uh, this right here, uh, belonging to Marco Dente, the engraver who carved the copper plate for Bandinelli. This must have been immensely popular in its day and thus repeatedly printed. For after some time, the original plate became so worn that it was no longer able to yield saleable impressions. The copy in the Art Institute of Chicago bears witness to the corrupted state of that original copper plate, whose subtle lines and cross-hatched shadings have all but disappeared. These short videos might be a helpful clarification for those unfamiliar with the engraving process. After a plate is carved, you'd apply ink into the carvings and run it through a very heavy press, which literally presses the ink onto a sheet of paper and yields a reversed copy that we call an impression. Not, but, bec but because of the great force being exerted on the plate during this process, it gets increasingly abraded with each printing until the plate becomes defunct and discarded. But at this point, if there still seemed to be a market demand for the print from buyers, collectors, we might just see a new copy being made by an enterprising artist or commissioned by a publisher. This impression at the Metropolitan Museum is that new copy we're talking about. Made in the 1540s, I mentioned, by Nicolas Beatrice, another French engraver in Rome, and sold in La Frerie's shop. But after his death in 1577, this massacre plate passed between the hands of new generations of print publishers alongside a big part of Lafrerie's inventory. Um, so we see actually the uh, Lafrerie's signature right here, um, but none of the, uh, um, the later uh, publisher information over there. Um, but uh, around uh, 1650, 1650, so well after 100 years after its original uh, making, um, the print, uh, the plate in fact, was eventually acquired by Giovanni Giacomo de Rossi, head of his family print shop. 
The relatively empty foreground on the right over there evidently seemed to be a convenient spot for him to announce his authorship of this new edition. And that's the story, um, the publication story of the Clark's impression that is currently on display. I, I do apologize for dwelling too long on this one single image and for this convoluted narration of a very niche and specialized issue among print scholars about editions, states, and impressions. But my hope is that by zooming into the prolonged afterlife of one reproductive print, we may be afforded a privileged view into how the arc of the Renaissance masters was received in Italy in the following centuries, as well as the crucial role of printmaking in shaping and responding to that reception. The renewed circulation of Bandinelli's design in the late 1600s, well over a century after its creation, prompted me to ask the questions. How did people in the period since the Renaissance engage with the art of the past? Where did we get the notion that art has a history and a course of birth, growth, maturity, and decline? And how did printmaking with its ability to copy, multiply, and reactivate old images contribute to the early modern formation of art history that lies at the foundation of our thinking today. These were the pressing questions that drove me into the inner chambers, both of the Manton Study Center and the rich special collections of the Clark Library in search of historical witnesses. Once I had dispelled my assumption that art history as, of art history as the single monolithic way of making sense of the past, I came to realize that historical thinking itself also has a history. And this is charted not only through the succession of scholarly texts written through the centuries, but also significantly through the printed images, especially the class of prints that used to be deemed reproductive and thus less artistic for their lack of any creative genius. But once we look at them through a historiographical perspective, as documents of the changing historical thought in the early modern period, these printed copies begin to take on a greater significance, as this exhibition, I hope, will show. Let us return then to the beginning. When the printing technique was introduced in Italy in the mid 1400s, not everyone recognized right away its revolutionary potential on art and image making. Most painters and sculptors continued their workshop practice as usual, but a few of them ventured to experiment with this new medium. Andrea Mantegna, working in his studio in Ferrara, hired professional engravers to execute many of his designs and probably even tried his hand at carving a few copper plates himself. This Madonna and child is likely one of his own creations, and the quivering lines of the natural drapery reveal not the work of a professional printmaker, but that of a seasoned crafts, a draftsman who was beginning to experiment with an unfamiliar and rather difficult technique. Other artists may choose to invest in their offspring. In the Venetian city of Vicenza, the leading painter Bartolomeo Montagna tried to incorporate printmaking into his studio practice by encouraging his son, Benedetto, to learn the skills and set up a printing press in the family shop. This, this Madonna and child is probably the first print made by the young Benedetto after his father's devotional panel painting. The first state of the print was in fact a faithful reproduction of the painting but the plate was recarved a few years later by another printmaker in the Montagna workshop and signed here as an independent work, right here. We are quite fortunate to have Bartolomeo's original painting here in the Clark collection, the so-called Williamstown Madonna. And the unique juxtaposition of the two works in this exhibition gives us the opportunity to consider them both as integral products of the Monta Montagna family workshop in the early 1500s, when printmaking began to take on ever more prominent roles in the Italian art world. That epochal transition was in part facilitated by Marcantonio Raimundi, 
arguably the first major personality in the history of Italian printmaking. Traveling from Bologna to Venice, he studied the innovative techniques of German and Netherlandish printmakers and subsequently brought them to Florence and Rome. Thanks to a loan from the Metropolitan Museum, we are able to see two of Raimundi's most ambitious works from his early years in Rome, dialoguing as they do with masters of no less renown than Raphael and Michelangelo. In the print on the left, Raimundi copied the central group of figures from Michelangelo's famous Battle of Cascina, an unfinished wall painting intended for the, for the Florentine city hall. It survived only in sketches and compositional drawings, but drew many aspiring young art students to Florence in the early 1500s. Raimundi studied them and extracted the grouping from the left edge of the composition. This, this grouping right here. But as he demonstrated his ability to imitate Michelangelo's formidable anatomical figures, he nevertheless placed them in the landscape of Lucas van Leiden's contemporary Netherlandish engraving. In an effort to show Michelangelo what he, the printmaker, was uniquely equipped to do, Raimundi seems to be offering an invitation to collaborate with the great maestro. But Michelangelo, busy at the time with the Sistine Chapel ceiling commission, gave no obvious heed to Raimundi's work. Fortunately enough, Raimundi found a willing collaborator in Raphael, head of a large studio in Rome who had no issue outsourcing his designs. He provided drawings specifically to be executed in print, such as this study for the Massacre of the Innocents, which translated in print uh, by, my, by Raimundi, rivaled the most sophisticated paintings of the day in its emotional intensity, compositional structure, and figural dynamism. The collaboration between the two artists is written in stone on the left side of the picture. Which records Marcantonio's monogram trademark, but attributes Raphael Urbino as the inventor of the design. They held a fruitful partnership in the subsequent years, which continued even after Raphael's death in 1520. By the way, this is what Baccio Bandinelli, 10 years later, would, was ex explicitly seeking to rival with his version of the Massacre of the Innocents. Of course, Raphael left behind a more than imposing legacy. And his studio works were not printed by Raimundi alone. Sometime after the maestro's death, a printmaker reproduced his mythological drawing of Hercules strangling the Nemean lion with a technique called chiaro scuro woodcut, which uses multiple wood blocks, in this case two, to create different color tones and a sense of shading. But just like Bandinelli's work, the impression in the Clark exhibition here on the left is also a late reprint. Whereas in its original states from the early to mid 1500s, see the Met impression on the right, the print was inscribed with the name of Raphael and the, wood, uh, and the woodblock artist. Right over here, Joseph or Giuseppe Niccolo Vicentino. In the Clark impression, however, we see that latter signature erased and replaced by the AA monogram of another chiaroscuro printmaker, Andrea Andreani, who acquired Vicentino's woodblocks and republished Raphael's design around the year 1600. Again, 50, 60 years after its original creation. Similar to copper plates, wood blocks also could also, could also be passed down as valuable assets from studio to studio. And they were often more durable because the printing process, lifting a piece of paper from the block, does less damage to the block than what the heavy press does to a plate. At any rate, with this example, we may again observe the circulation of old master designs in the long afterlife of the Italian Renaissance. And that prints, such as the Hercules, recently published by Andreani, would attract as eager a student as Peter Paul Rubens in the early 1600s. This tells us that the new editions of historical works are being studied, collected, and referenced. But how was Renaissance art history 
considered in the subsequent centuries. How did artists, scholars, and collectors in Italy view their artistic past? The case of Michelangelo presents some interesting insights in this respect. Growing to maturity just around the year 1500, the young Michelangelo made his name through famous works such as the Vatican Pietà, the David, and the Sistine Chapel ceiling. But he also lived to be 89 years old and was thus able to witness a period of over half a century in which the reputations of earlier artists, himself included, were solidified, disseminated, and contested. When the last judgment was completed in 1541, it instigated a public debate between those who believed the work to be a masterpiece with powerful figuration and complex poses, and those who found it scandalous for the nude bodies of holy figures and excessively artificial and stylized musculature. Nevertheless, the painting came to be memorialized as a major artistic monument and copied by a number of printmakers within decades. In this print from the Williams College Museum of Art, Domenico Fiorentino rendered in reverse a small section of figures on the right side of Christ, right over here, while some other printmakers chose to reproduce the entire composition. In those same decades, the art of Michelangelo became a major point of discussion also among literary circles. In Florence in 1547, the poet and historian Benedetto Varchi delivered a lecture at the Florentine Academy on Michelangelo's art theory, based on his sonnet, Non all'ultimo artista alcun concetto. Michelangelo was also a prolific writer of Italian poetry. And in one of them, he put forward the artistic concept that the best artist has no idea that was not already contained in a single stone. And this can only be reached with the hand that obeys the intellect. These are the first two lines of the sonnet that Michelangelo wrote. In the lecture, which then circulated as a booklet, Varchi ex explicated these lines along a Neoplatonic framework, effectively elevating Michelangelo's art as something equivalent to a philosophical exercise. In 1550 then, the painter, architect, and biographer Giorgio Vasari launched his monumental tome of artist biographies, The Lives of the Most Excellent Italian Architects, Painters, and Sculptors, in which he narrated the historical progression of Italian art since its rebirth in the late Middle Ages up to its maturity in his own time. As a Tuscan himself and working for the Medici court in Florence, Vasari prioritized native artists from the region and considered Florence and Rome the indisputable centers of artistic activity. Giotto, Donatello, Brunelleschi, Leonardo da Vinci, this is the major canon that, uh, of Renaissance art that we got from him. The book culminated in the life of Michelangelo, the first biography of a living artist. He was 75 at the time. In Vasari's account, Michelangelo achieved the consummate perfection in the arts of painting, sculpture, and architecture, and thus deserved to be positioned at the pinnacle of the long course of artistic revival in the Renaissance age. Yet, understandably, this was not the narrative that would satisfy everyone, especially not those who belonged to the alternative artistic traditions outside of Florence. In response, in response to Vasari, the Venetian humanist Lodovico Dolce published his dialogue on painting over there on the right, essentially a, st a staged debate between the Florentine and the Venetian points of views, which concluded by championing Titian above both Raphael and Michelangelo. Despite such regional resistance, the Vasarian narrative persisted in Italy and gradually became a pan-European phenomenon especially after the 1568 publication of the second expanded edition of The Lives of the Artists. 18 years in its making, the new edition included more historical and contemporary figures, more anecdotes and source materials, and elaborate woodcut portraits to illustrate the biographies. 
is sought to be the first and the most comprehensive history of Renaissance art and artists. And it was extremely successful at, in this aim. Individual readers continued to criticize Vasari's errors and biases in the text, for, for, but for some 300 years until the 19th century, the lives of the artists remained the most authoritative primary source for the study of Italian Renaissance art. This critical and historiographical discourse grants us an important perspective in the study of early modern reproductive printmaking. Those who were printing, buying, and viewing the work of Baccio Bandinelli in the 1600s would certainly have their copy of Vasari out as a key reference. And they would find Vasari's description of the print saying, quote, this scene, which was filled by him with a quantity of nudes, both male and female, children living and dead, and women and soldiers in various attitudes, made known the fine drowsmanship that he showed in figures and his knowledge of muscles and all of, all the, of all the members. And it won him great fame over all of Europe." End quote. This gave readers a critical language to evaluate Bandinelli's art and a critical view to engage with. They might even fit the work, uh, this work within the larger picture of artistic progression in the Renaissance period. That is to say, prints of old master designs circulated in the early modern period, not in a conceptual vacuum, but rather within a historical framework that was becoming increasingly well-defined. Thus, publishers reprinted old master works because they knew there'd be a market. Buyers collected them as they corroborated the words of historians by offering concrete visual testimonies to the developments of, of the arts. With the help of reproductive prints, collectors became uniquely empowered to construct archives of images that became living sites of art history and art historical discussions. Another engraving in the Clark collection speaks powerfully to the persistence of artistic afterlife. Made in the 1470s by Antonio del Polaiuolo, the Battle of the Nude Men represented a major development in early Italian printmaking for its monumental size and compositional complexity. Since its creation, however, impressions continued to be pulled from the copper plate until it became overly worn and discarded by the early 1600s. The Clark sheet is likely one of the late impressions around that time, printed when the plate had started to lose its more subtle details, which is actually um, more visible uh, in this part. Thus far, we have mostly considered works of art in the Renaissance era, traditionally conceived as the period of transition between the 1400s and the mid 1500s. Certainly, its historical legacy has cast a towering influence in the ensuing centuries. But as art continued to evolve, new histories came to be written and new prints were also made after contemporary paintings. This annunciation seen by Federico Barocci is a great example. Having completed the painting in 1584 for a chapel in the Basilica of Loreto, the artist soon turned his composition into a print, the one in the center. Combining the techniques of engraving, uh, that is carving directly into the copper plate, and etching, uh, scratching a layer of wax off the plate and using uh, an acidic chemical to bite into the design, which is easier to learn for a practicing artist who wasn't professionally trained for metalwork. The print circulated, and just a few years later, the French printmaker Philippe Thomasin copied this work in reverse, the one on the right on ex uh, in the exhibition, and published it in Rome. Engraved entirely by a professional, the new print was likely an entrepreneurial effort to capitalize on Barocci's popularity. But at the same time, it indirectly helped to facilitate a wider appreciation for his emotive style among contemporaries. The continuous development of art after Vasari's Renaissance called for new historical narratives. And in 1672, with the publication of the lives of the modern painters, sculptors, and architects, 
the Roman historian Giovan Pietro Bellori rose to the challenge of picking up where Vasari had left off. He generally agreed with his predecessor's narrative of, of birth, growth, and maturity in the course of Renaissance art, but he saw the period in the later 1500s as a period of decline, when Florence fell to the mannerist obsession with Michelangelo's style, and Rome swayed by Caravaggio's fashionable but extreme version of naturalism. Bellori celebrated Federico Barocci as the finest painter of that day, but considered another artist to be the almost providential savior of the declining Renaissance artistic tradition. This was Annibale Caracci, who ran an art academy in Bologna with his brother and cousin, but made his name in Rome around 1600 with the monumental fresco cycle painted on a ceiling of the Farnese Palace. The painting is a Baroque spectacle. Filling every inch of space, Karachi turned the vaulted ceiling into an illusionistic canvas, painted with pseudo-marble sculpture, bronze relief, and framed canvases. They decorate 13 narrative scenes depicting the loves of the ancient gods, with stories drawn from a variety of classical sources. In Bellori's biography of Annibale Caracci, he explicates the iconography of each scene and praises the work as successfully combining an overall effect of wondrous exuberance with a restrained classicism of the individually framed um, scenes, uh, individually framed compositions. For this, he celebrates Annibale enthusiastically as the genius who restored the art of painting from its tragic decline after Raphael's time. Inspired by Bellori, Giovanni Giacomo de Rossi, the Roman publisher whom we've already encountered as the printer of the Bandinelli engraving, commissioned a suite of prints from Pietro Aquila, a reproductive engraver from Sicily who was tasked to visualize Caracci's entire decorative program in the Farnese Gallery. The suite opens with an allegory, specifically designed for the publication, which represents, and I quote the inscription written here, um, Annibale Caracci, restored fallen painting. Annibale Caracci, restored fallen painting. Remember this is an allegory. From the darkness by his light. Light. And guided painting to the temple of Apollo and Athena. This celebra celebratory tone is entirely in line with Bellori's view, and the mythological scenes found in subsequent pages are introduced with the historian's iconographic exegesis below each image. While these prints were issued as a suite and often bound by collectors into, book, into a book, the copy in our library at the Clark actually contains 25 loose leaf pages with which we took the liberty to pro project sections of the Farnese Gallery's walls and vaulted ceiling in this exhibition. This is the northeast view showing scenes uh, from left to right of Jupiter and Juno, Venus and Triton, Diana and Endymion. And this is the southeast view showing scenes um, uh, with Polyphemus and Galatea above and Perseus and Andromeda below. And on the right, in this very popular view of the Farnese Gallery in the 1700s, we can see all these paintings depicted on the walls and the vault. Um, so right here is the southeast view, and then this is um, the elevation that we're showing, the sites we're showing just now. And finally, um, on the, there in the center of the frescoed ceiling is the largest narrative of them all depicting the frenzied parade of Bacchus and Ariadne, the ancient god of wine and his bride. In, um, in Annibale's biography, Bellori extensively describes this painting as the principal work of the gallery. And if we look closely at the, in the gallery, um, actually, uh, I notice we can't see it, but um, if you look at the, uh, the print itself, if you handle it, um, and if you look at the edges of the sheet, we'd see that this print shows a high degree of wear and marks of handling in comparison 
with others in the suite. So it probably received disproportionate attention from period viewers who might have passed it around uh, among friends during a heated artistic or art historical discussion. As we have seen, the proliferation of print and printed books from the mid 1500s onward fostered an ever growing awareness of and interest in the history of Italian art. Since Giorgio Vasari first set the tone for the historiographical debate, most subsequent discussions on Renaissance art pivoted around his narrative, focusing on a canonical group of Florentine and Roman protagonists. But one piece of Renaissance art also had a critical fortune beyond Italy. In 1660, in the milieu of Louis XIV court in France, the engraver Gerard Edelink produced a copy of a long lost masterpiece by Leonardo da Vinci. Back in 1504, Leonardo was commissioned to paint a monumental battle scene at the city hall in Florence, directly in competition with Michelangelo's aforementioned Battle of Cascina. Remember that that one inspired Raimundi's engraving. Um, and this is the, uh, the hall of 500 in the Florence, uh, Florentine city hall. Um, and at that time, Michelangelo and uh, Leonardo were working like directly in competition uh, with each other. And this was a, a staged competition uh, intentionally. Um, like his younger rival, however, Leonardo also left the painting unfinished and it was later destroyed around 1560 during Vasari's architectural renovation campaign. So all these are new. On his trip to Italy in the early 1600s, Peter Paul Rubens saw a printed reproduction of the central group, of Leonardo's central group, taken before the destruction of his fresco and copied it in a drawing. This he brought to Paris, which later served as the model of Edelink's engraving. But this fascination with Leonardo was not a singular occurrence. Already in 1651, a book of his biography and art theory had been published in Paris. And it was richly illustrated with pedagogical images, like this, for the comprehension of French artists who might or might not have been able to read the Italian text. The favorable reception of Italian art, theory, and history north of the Alps is not a major topic addressed in this exhibition. But still back in Rome, we see a continuation of the Vasarian canon and a persistent interest in the same canonical figures. A Renaissance print made by Raimundi after Raphael's design, recall their prolific partnership, was copied in reverse 200 years later in the early 1700s and published by none other than the heir of Giovanni Giacomo de Rossi. Compared to Raimundi's elegant original, the copy on the right is at best a medio of mediocre quality. But the information, the, but the informative inscription on the pedestal, detailing that the image represents the Sibyls Tiburtina and Cumana invented by Raphael Urbino in Rome, reveals the intention of this copy as strictly art historical. The juxtaposition of these two prints in the exhibition affords us a view into the issues of artistic survival, reception, and historicization in early modern Italy. Of course, this increasingly ingrained cultural attitude toward Renaissance art would not have been possible without the repeated publication of important texts. For example, this second edition of Bellori's 1695 book, the description of the images painted by Raphael of Urbino in the Vatican Palace and in the Villa Farnesina, was published again in 1751 together with Vasari's Life of Raphael. Shifting away from the genre of artistic biography, Bellori focuses on the analysis of individual works and enshrines Raphael's fresco cycle at the Vatican including the School of Athens, as a crucial event of Renaissance art history. I think this is how we as a society started to become so familiar with this image. But we must not forget that outside central Italy, there still existed robust artistic traditions that continued to inspire new generations of artists. 
After Titian, the judicial use of color became almost the trademark of Venetian painting. And this can be seen vividly in Paolo Veronese's 1563 Marriage of Cana. Over there, uh, made for the monastery of San Giorgio Maggiore. In 1731, the printmaker John Baptist Jackson arrived in Venice, where he undertook a grand project reproducing 17 large paintings by Venetian Renaissance masters. This sizable chiaroscuro woodcut, remarkable for its subtle ap application of a wide range of colors, shows Jackson's attempt to convey the monumental scale and the rich colorism of Veronese's painting. Precisely around this time, Venetian thinkers were also developing their own views of art history. In 1733, based on an earlier text, the historian Anton Maria Zanetti wrote a critical work describing and analyzing the progression of Italian art from the medieval primitives to the Renaissance art artist of Venice. Emboldened by its success, he began writing a large scale account of the Venetian school, which he published nearly 40 years later as On Venetian Painting and the Public Works by Venetian Masters. The formation of art historical debates in 17th and 18th century Italy remains to be further investigated. And the meager selection of works in this concluding section can by no means do full justice to this profoundly important issue. Especially as art scholars in museums and universities today continue to call for a less monolithic vision of art history, we might ask how, if at all, we could contest or modify the so deeply ingrained and persistent canon. At the close of an exhibition on the major figures of the Florentine Roman tradition, these two little, seemingly insignificant paint prints might just give us pause. The one was made by the Venetian Zanetti's elder cousin after Parmigianino, who was from the northern Italian city of Parma. And the other by a little known Genoese after Dosso Dossi, the court artist of Renaissance Ferrara, also in the north. None of these figures had a deeply felt engagement with the art of the major centers. So we may decide to call them idiosyncratic. These images do not pretend to have the classical solemnity of a Raphael or a Michelangelo, or the heated drama of a Bandinelli or a Caracci. But in their lack of a, prestigi a, presidi uh, in their lack of a prestigious lineage, of layer upon layer of historiographical discourse that demand them to be something more, something symbolic. In that absence, we encounter an art that appears refreshingly self-sufficient. It leads us back to our most instinctive level of artistic sensibility, free from the burden of history. By virtue of their being here, of their refusal to engage with the august canon, they defy any imposition of grand historical narratives, silently but powerfully. In other words, due to the lack of historical material and scholarly discussion on these works, I really have nothing intelligent to say about them. Uh, so so, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and hope you may enjoy the exhibition. Um, and thank you so much for, for being here. <laughs> Um, that was a magnificent and eloquent talk. Thank you, Yue Feng. Uh, we're going to take um, some time for Q and A. Uh, the questions from the from the audience. Um, and I, I just want to say, as you're gathering your thoughts for questions, um, your, your remark about um, seeing the evidence of the wear and tear on that main Karachi image, uh, and which is unfortunately not possible in the exhibition, I, that, that reminded me to point all of you to um, our app. So the Clark, you may know, has a new app uh, through uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, Bloomberg Connects. Um, I, I do encourage you to, to download it and then to take advantage of all the app content for our exhibitions. And for this one, we have 
um, a full, uh, an exhibition video that traces through some of these same issues, but um, I just wanted, be, because um, you saw the effectiveness of seeing the um, additional content, the sort of comparative imagery that elucidates so many of the issues uh, for the prints on view, and that is also richly um, provided in the exhibition video on the app. So I just wanted to make a little plug for that. Um, and if you wanna come back to the podium, maybe take some questions. <clears throat> Roger. There is a mic that, that we can use for. Um, and I can also, uh, I think I'm also going to hang out in the gallery for a little bit uh, if anyone uh, wants like, uh, to chat in front of specific works or has uh, any spe specific questions too. Yeah. Okay, is this on? Yeah. Um, thanks so much for this wonderful talk. I was curious about um, the kind of timeline that the exhibition constructs because mm. what's really interesting uh, about your work here is that we're looking at these reproductive prints that are uh, reissued over really, you know, the 15th, 16th, 17th, and, and up to the 18th century. But it's interesting because it's in the 18th century that you have the first generation of what we would recognize now as art historians yeah. like Winkelmann or Chikonyara, who are also making um, really diligent use of printmaking to, um, to, you know, to to illustrate art historical argumentation. And so, I, I don't know. I'm curious just what your thoughts about that kind of turn are. And really, to me, what your talk reveals is that. Uh, the work that those 18th and, and early 19th century figures were doing is actually not so different from even going back to Vasari and, and you know, perhaps earlier because we have these examples of, right. um, you know, word and image together for such a long time. So I'm just curious kind of what you would say about the timeline and, and how you think about that moment in this longer trajectory that the exhibition plots out. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for the question. Um, the uh, uh, the, the timeline of the um, of this exhibition is entirely arbitrary. So I pretty much in the beginning I, I walked you through uh, my process of of coming to this topic. So first discovering one piece of print um, from the 17th century, um, and then uh, discovering that suite of the Karachi um, uh, of the Karachi uh, print uh, in the library, um, and wanting to show show these works. Um, so. I kind of just went forward a little bit and went backward a little bit um, so to present a fuller image uh, from the Renaissance on to um, the 18th century. But actually, um, if there's even more space, uh, if I'm allowed more space, I might even show uh, 19th century um, books uh, on Renaissance art history, which in one book would reproduce, um, or would outline the course of, of um, Renaissance art history with images facing the, um, the discussions. And that's basically um, the model um, of even our Renaissance art history textbooks, um, and not just the Renaissance, but you know, textbooks um, overall today. Um, yeah, so in, uh, in, the in the 17th century, in the 18th century actually, yeah, um, there definitely emerged a, a group of people uh, whom we might call professional art historians who were very much utilizing the print um, the, the, well, a print culture to make their point, essentially. Uh, in fact, that originated from an effort, uh, a failure actually, uh, a failed effort to illustrate Vasari's uh, lives. And, and that, that didn't work out, um, but later on um, people uh, really started putting prints in, in their historical narratives um, to, to um, make their point so that you, you're also looking at something. Yeah, um, so, I guess it's from that point that I go back to these prints um, to trace out a prehistory or a proto-history, you, you might want to call, um, of that art historical culture that began professionally, um, well, in, in, the, in the 19th century, but also you know, if we push it back to Winkelmann, um, if we call him a professional art historian, um, then yeah. So uh, trying to, trying to um, bring together books and prints that you know, in our present day scholarly milieu has sometimes been considered separately, 
um, but trying to see uh, the connection between them um, before they came together. Yeah. I hope that answers um, your question, yeah. Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. Uh, do we know the intended audience of these prints? And you know, were they available uh, to a common person? Were they able to purchase them, or did these get distributed to, like, to the church or other institutions? Yeah. Um, I guess depending depending on how you define the common per common person. Um, the, uh, the mi a, a miller in the village in rural Italy would not probably be buying these prints. Um, and uh, you might have artists in their studios um, who want to look at how past artists have done things. Um, you might have collectors uh, who are interested in these images uh, and also um, an, an emergent class of professional scholars. Um, so they humanists um, and people who are not necessarily affiliated with courts or you know the so-called high society, um, but people who are um, reading, um, humanistically trained, and uh, reading um, and, and thinking about um, the visual arts um, and perhaps their relationship with literature, uh, philosophy, issues like that. Yeah, I, I think that's my current understanding of the issue. Yeah, of the audience. Um, I was wondering if these would have circulated in Northern Europe as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, England, France, Germany, probably the Netherlands too. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's how Italian art history, you know, among all the national schools um, became, you know, almost attained this almost mythological status. Um, you know, as, as the consummate expression of uh, Western European culture, basically. And, and that, of course, it's a, it's a later 19th century German idea, um, looking back to, um, to Italy, finding the source of modern culture, basically. Yeah, um, but people, uh, and especially art schools, art academies are being founded all over Europe based on Italian models, based on, you know, the model that Vasari uh, established, for example, in, the, uh, in Florence and also the uh, Accademia di San Luca in Rome. Um, and through, uh, in, the, in the 17th century, I, meant, I briefly mentioned this, but didn't go, through, uh, go into this. Um, yeah, see, this is, uh, yeah, Louis XIV's uh, Louis XIV's court, um, during uh, whose rule, the um, Royal Academy of, of Painting and Sculpture was established in France um, based on Italian models. Uh, and in fact, this, uh, I mentioned that this um, art treatise was published in um, Paris uh, of, by, uh, by an admirer of Leonardo, and the, the text is Italian. So, you know, those French artists must, you know, those who are reading it um, must be at least literate in Italian um, to, to, to get an idea of this. And, and the fact that this is published um, means it, it probably had some kind of audience. Um, although it might be difficult now to to gul gulch precisely who those audience um, were. Yeah, and in England, um, there was also a Royal Academy um, established by Joshua Reynolds. Um, yeah, and pretty much all that tradition um, looked back to uh, Renaissance Italy as the point of origin. Um, just thank you all for attending. And again, Yuefeng has kindly offered to um, spend some time in the exhibition gallery uh, right after this, so you can meet him there and maybe have extend uh, the conversation more casually. Um, but thank you so much again, and enjoy your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.